Good morning, everyone. And thank you, May, for that thought-provoking uh, thought, thought uh, presentation. So that's a very nice introduction to the round table. So my name is Lin Lee, and I'm delighted to be the moderator of today's round table for emerging professionals. I am an assistant scientist at the Committee Conservation Institute, and I'm currently the coordinator for the ICOMCC Scientific Research Working Group. ICOMCC is one of ICOM's 30 international committees and the largest, with 21 working groups under its umbrella. ICOMCC's mission is to promote the conservation of culturally, naturally, and historically significant works, to further the goals of the conservation profession, and to provide opportunities to collaborate and study. Emerging professionals is an area of emphasis for ICOMCC. As such, we felt that this was a great opportunity to collaborate with the CIAB Conference Organizing Committee in putting together this roundtable. So many thanks to you, Giorgio, Mattia, and Judith for working together on this collective effort. The panel will discuss topics that are important to emerging professionals, including insights to how to navigate the job market, what qualities are needed to be successful in the field, balancing priorities from different stakeholders, funding, and how the diverse skill sets of heritage scientists can be leveraged in today's job market. The last two days have shown the range and diversity of heritage science in tackling complex and multidimensional problems, a testimony to the cross-disciplinary nature of our field. So before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to outline the structure of today's roundtable. Firstly, I'll introduce the panelists and give their backgrounds. Then each panelist will briefly give an introduction. Uh, we'll address some questions and topics, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. During the audience Q&A, I ask that you wait for the microphone and state your name and affiliation. Also, please address which panelists you are directing your questions to. So I'm delighted to introduce our panelists who are professionals in movable and immovable heritage. Representative sectors include industry, academia, private practice, nonprofit, and museum institutions. I'm going to start alphabetically. <laughs> and Alejandra Alberne is a lecturer at the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage, where she is joint assistant course director of the MSC Sustainable Heritage Program. She is a structural engineer and construction historian, specializing in traditional structures and conservation of built heritage, in particular of heritage and Alejandra received her PhD in engineering and archaeology from the University of Oxford and has over 12 years of experience in the field of conservation of architecture, both in academia and in industry. Her work in this field is cross-disciplinary, spanning areas that include the evolution of vernacular construction techniques, the structural safety of masonry buildings, and social engagement in heritage conservation. Before taking her position, at the Institute for Sustainable Heritage, Alejandra alternated her academic research with professional work, spending more than eight years in industry working for specialized structural engineering firms in London and Madrid. Our ne next panelist is Robin Liggins. Robin is the director of QI3 and specializes in international technology marketing, focusing on strategy, marketing, sales, and technology translation. His private clients range from large corporations to startup companies. In the public sector, Robin has led major market evaluation and engagement projects for the European Space Agency, Technology Strategy Board, UK Research Councils, and a wide range of universities. Robin is a steering committee member for CEHA and provides expertise and input on the engagement of heritage science with wider industry sectors. Our next panelist is Philippa McDonald. Philippa completed her BA in art, in art history at the University of Warwick 
in 2012, followed by a postgraduate diploma in conservation at the University of Lincoln in 2013. She was awarded the Arts, Humanities, and Research Council Professional Practice Studentship in 2014, which allowed her to continue her conservation studies at Lincoln to the master's level, while simultaneously working with Lincoln Conservation, a commercial consultancy specializing in the conservation, restoration, and research of historic interiors and decorative surfaces. As part of her role at Lincoln Conservation, Philippa manages and engages in commercial projects, academic research, and student and public engagement. Her clients include Historic England and the English Heritage, the National Trust, and the Royal Household. Currently, Philippa is undertaking a PhD in architectural paint research while continuing her position with Lincoln Conservation. Then I'd also like to introduce Carolyn Peach, who is the Consultant Development Director to the National Heritage Science Forum. She is an independent consultant who has worked with NHSF for, over, for the last five years to help the forum deliver a range of activities, which includes coordinating policy responses for the sector, develop initiatives that facilitate shared access to equipment, and work to produce a national, a new national science sorry, a new national heritage science strategy for the UK. She has an MA in paper conservation and an MA in geography. She has worked in libraries, archives, and museums. From 2009 to 2013, she ran the British Library Preservation Advisory Center. And then David Saunders. And he received his DPhil in chemistry and then joined the National Gallery of London in 1985. From 2005 to 2015, he was the keeper of the Department of Conservation and Scientific Research at the British Museum, where he is currently an honorary research fellow. He is also currently a visiting professor at UCL's Institute for Sustainable Heritage. And amongst his many other positions, he is a fellow and former vice president of the International Institute for Conservation. From 2003 to 2009, he was IIC director of publications and was an editor for studies in conservation for nearly 20 years. <clears throat> his research interests encompass the deterioration of museum objects particularly pigments and painted surfaces, and the effect of display and storage environments on such damage. He also pioneered the application of high-resolution digital imaging methods to assist in the examination of paintings and other cultural heritage objects. And then finally, Joe Thompson is a senior partnership manager at UCL Innovation and Enterprise. She is responsible for identifying and developing strategic partnerships with companies in the creative industries, arts, humanities, and social societal sectors. Jo has lectured at international conferences and institutions on art and industry engagement. Before joining UCL, she was a consultant with the creative industries, collaborating with cultural institutions to meet organi organizational priorities, stimulate innovation, and facilitate business partnership. Jo is a member of the Royal Academy School's alumni and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. So I'd like to begin with Alejandra to make her introductory remarks. Um, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Uh, Ling has given you the, the facts, uh, and I'll just sort of run you through how, how it all happened. So I'm not, I'm not quite a scientist, I'm, I'm an engineer, but I am specialised in conservation of um, traditional building structures. Um, it's, a, it's a career that I didn't even know it existed when I, when I got into engineering. Um, it all started with a photo very much like this one, that came up on the screen uh, in a lecture theatre full of 300 aspiring 
engineers in the middle of the structures lecture and, and I saw the light. I, I had decided to study engineering without really knowing what I was going to do afterwards, if I was going to design planes or build roads. Um, and when I learned that uh, an engineer could have, a, could have a career conserving buildings like this one, um, I, that, that just made a call for me, that, that made it all clear. The reason why this picture came up on the wall was because Ely Cathedral was restored by one of the professors of my, of my university, Professor Dax Heyman, who um, I, ha I was very lucky to meet. He is the father of uh, modern uh, theory, modern structural theory for the analysis of masonry structures and author of, um, of uh, a very famous book, The Stone Skeleton. So also the fact that I was able to meet this man who gave me an overview of how to go about becoming an engineer in this field was very, very helpful at the very early stages of, of, my, of my training. So when I finished my, my undergraduate degree, I took a job with a, in a specialized structural engineering firm in London, Alan Baxter and Associates. Um, and do you, no, do, if you go back, do you have a pointer? Yeah. Uh, can I point? So here is where I spent my first day of professional work. Up the southwestern tower of St. Paul's Cathedral, looking at Great Paul, the largest cast uh, bell in Great Britain, I believe. And uh, up in the golden pineapple right at the top, looking, um, looking at how to strengthen them and how to preserve them. I was really lucky. I, I got to work in some very exciting buildings, St. Paul's Cathedral, obviously one of them, the Houses of Parliament, Kettlestone Hall, the Jeffrey Museum. But when I was working in this firm, I was becoming very aware that I had never had formal training on how to analyze or restore these structures. So I did an, uh, a standard structural engineering degree in a good university where traditional structures just did not feature. Um, I was learning in practice, of course I was, but I felt that I wanted to learn faster. Um, and I decided to go and do a master's course in uh, mechanics of uh, historic buildings. And I did this in the School of Architecture uh, of Madrid, in the Polytechnic University of Madrid. Uh, so I moved to Madrid, and when I finished this master's, I didn't lose ties, I didn't break ties with the university. I continued collaborating with the team that led the masters that I run, and I collaborated in some uh, research projects, assisted them in field work, and published some papers together. But I went back to industry, and I took, um, I, I took a job as a, as a structural engineer. In Spain, what I found is there were no specialized firms, but specialized individuals. So I was a specialized individual in a firm, in a good firm, where we work very closely to architects, but I didn't always get to work on historic buildings. Sometimes I did, and this is an example of probably the most exciting project that I worked on in Madrid. This is a very early 1930s um, industrial building, the Belgian sawmill, that has now been restored and converted into an art center. Um, so every now and then I got to do exciting projects, but it wasn't a regular thing. And for me, it was very clear I wanted to be a conservation engineer. Um, so I started rethinking how do I go about this and decided to do a PhD. This also combined with the fact that uh, the crisis hit the construction industry very hard uh, in Spain. So it was the ideal time to go and do a PhD. Um, and I did a, a PhD where I further specialised on analysis of, of structures. I started looking at how they behave in earthquakes, and I did my PhD on this fantastic case study, the Basilica of Maxentius, ancient Roman construction. During the PhD, not only did I work on, on, um, on structural analysis, but I also worked very closely with archaeologists, architecture historians, classicists, and this taught me a lot about interdisciplinary work. And I started looking at things not only from the eyes of an engineer, but from the eyes of other, of other specialists. I started really um, taking on board 
the perspectives of the other disciplines that come into play when we're talking about the conservation of heritage. Uh, and at the end of the PhD, I thought, okay, let's go back to industry. So um, I went back to uh, I went back to industry in, in I stayed in London and I took a job with uh, Arab. They have a specialized team in the London office, which is the existing structures existing structures team, um, and I worked with them and uh, I worked with, with them for two years and a half. We worked on some. Some in, in, interesting buildings. Uh, this is the Cold Drops project that is currently being uh, completed uh, behind Queen's Cross. And we looked after all of the cast iron structure and all of the um, original masonry. Um, mm. This was fun, but this wasn't as interdisciplinary as, as I wished. Uh, and I thought that my skills uh, at that stage played better in academia and I attempted to come back into academia and I was very lucky to, to have an opportunity about a year ago to join um, the Institute for Sustainable Heritage and uh, this, is, this is where I am. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, Robin. Good morning everybody. You may be wondering why the suit from industry is set up here on the uh, podium today. Um, what I'd like to do is give you a whistle-stop tour of my background, very briefly, how it became connected with heritage, and then some of the challenges and interesting areas we come across as we start to map the interface between heritage and the wider world, and how this might give you some challenges and some opportunities to think about in terms of your future careers. And obviously this will be picked up in more detail later when we get into the question and answer session. So, very briefly, BSc in Chemistry from Manchester, followed by an MBA from Liverpool University. Um, quite a bit of continuous professional development after that. Never forget that, it's absolutely important. I then went into the traditional corporate career and climbed to the greasy pole. Through air products with industrial gases, um, Raychem with heating systems for industry, um, pore filtration in the biotech and pharmaceutical sector, ending up as market and strategy director for one of the major divisions of Oxford Instruments, where I had my first interfaces with heritage when I was looking at applications of analytical instruments in the heritage sector and had the privilege to visit the Getty Labs over in Los Angeles as one of my um, parts of my investigation. Went on to then run a couple of um, Oxford Instruments Medical Instrumentation businesses, followed by running a chromatography and fluid transfer business for Halmer in Cambridge. I then had a slight epiphany and decided that corporate life came with a certain amount of baggage that I wasn't particularly interested in continuing to carry, and moved into consulting with a colleague of mine who had been in Oxford Instruments at the same time. Um, and we both had a passion for working out the connection between innovative science and technology and its impact. Traditionally, you think about impact in terms of exploitation in products, companies, etc. But impact is much wider. Impact of technologies can be clinical, can be environmental, can be social, can have major productivity impacts on the economy and the cascade that has throughout the whole of society. And so client base as Lynn mentioned, is corporate, um, is academic, and is what we call governmental as well. That started my connections with um, heritage, first through a meeting with May at the Desbury Synchrotron a number of years ago, when we started talking about the impact of the interface between instrumentation and heritage. I then became a steering committee member for the CHA program. I've supported May in a Arts and Humanities Research Council project. I've ended up working with Caroline on a workshop for the National Heritage Science uh, <coughs> Forum. And I've been working extensively with, uh, with Matea recently on the interface between the CHA program and industry. And there's a range, it's, when you start looking at that interface of heritage science to the wider world, you come across some interesting and surprising opportunities. I see heritage as very similar to 
instrumentation and sensors, which we did a range of work along, on a long time ago. And it was written off as a sort of orphan type of sector, small but not important, until government and the Treasury woke up to the fact that 75% of the FTSE 100 companies cannot function without sensors and instrumentation. So it is an enabling technology. And I think when you're looking at the interface of heritage with the wider world, it, this um, exemplar of an enabling technology, this analog, becomes quite relevant. Because in the work that we've been doing, we've uncovered a number of interfaces where heritage science has big impact on wider sectors. The first most obvious one is what I would call the heritage services sector. This is companies who are providing services back into the heritage sector. So they may be archaeologists, they may be in preservation, um, they may be in conservation, they may be in the law. Um, there's a range of areas where there are a broad need for heritage scientists to help support these activities. Another obvious one is heritage tourism. Now, you may think what's heritage science got to do with that, but take a look at the rise in heritage tourism. How do we enable visitors of ever increasing numbers to go through heritage assets that were never designed for the numbers. Look at the footfall through, um, for example, National Trust properties at the moment, and imagine what happens if that then doubles. How do we preserve these assets, these greater you know, inheritances, so that the maximum number of people can use them without them being destroyed? And then it becomes even more interesting because we've been doing a lot of work recently with Alejandro on interfaces with the construction and infrastructure sector. So for example, HS2 has some major problems. They have a whole range of archaeological sites they're coming across as part of that program. They have to both excavate and investigate every single site and they have to archive every single find. Can you imagine how much money is going to be spent on archiving and preserving another 5,000 flint arrowheads? So there are some major questions to be asked about what is our policy, what should we be maintaining as these infrastructure projects go ahead? Then there's a the whole challenge of about repurposing of infrastructure. On the local news last night, I was watching a program about the maintenance of one of the tunnels on the East Coast Line. That tunnel is 150 years old. They're doing maintenance work. Now, it was originally designed for steam engines. It's now taking high-speed trains with 24,000 volt power supplies um, at a frequency that's much higher than it was ever designed for. And they're having to maintain it and repurpose it and protect it for another 50 or 100 years. Some major challenges there in about conservation. And then you take buildings, particularly heritage buildings, should we preserve them in aspic, as one of the contributors to a recent workshop said, or should we be looking at repurposing them? And how do you decide what part of the heritage in that building should be maintained, and what part can actually be lost or preserved digitally in order to enable that building to be used for modern 21st century um, opportunities? So some really interesting opportunities there. Media is another one. How do we preserve the media sector? Is it purely about celluloid? But what happens to all the digital media? What's our policy? We've got such vast amounts of media now. How do we even start to manage and understand what we have in our archives? So what are the challenges that I see? Well, part of it is removing the barriers to repurposing or deployment of media in the 21st century. We are a, we are a a whole world of change. We're not going to stop change. So how do we guide, how do we inform, how do we enable that change? How do we decide what in heritage can be repurposed and what should be preserved as it was? And then picking up on May's theme, where are the new services, the new ideas, the new uses that we can pick up for heritage that will contribute to society? Not only economically, but socially. Clinically, there's evidence that exposure to heritage can have major benefits on mental health outcomes. How do we decide and investigate those areas so heritage can grow substantially in its contribution to the broader society? So my key challenge is, what is the value proposition of heritage? There's all we're looking at, there's major challenges for resources within the world. 
How do we then match heritage against cancer treatments? Looking after the homeless, major improvements in our air quality. We have to build the value proposition for heritage, and I think that's where heritage science can provide us with the tools and the capabilities to understand how to do that. So that's me. Thank you, Next one. I work with Lincoln Conservation, so we're a conservation, restoration and research company that works within the University of Lincoln. Um, our main sort of, uh, skill is architectural paint research, which is kind of like archaeology of decorative schemes. So I'm definitely more on the art side than the science side, but I work with both. Um, similar to Alianza, I had no idea that this career existed, not even when I was in school, but before that, until I was doing my graduate diploma, no idea that this existed. Um, and in a way that's how I got into it. I've kind of been quite selfish in my career progression in that I've kind of just gone down the routes that interested me most. So even when I was choosing my BA, when I was at school, I really, really liked art and I really, really liked history. So I put the words art and history into the UCAS and art history came up. I didn't know it existed, but I knew I liked both sides. So I was like, well, I'll give it a go. If I don't like it, it's only three years and a couple of thousand pounds in debt, so it's fine. Um, and then when I was doing art history, I suddenly got into my third year and realised that I didn't want to go into art leadership or be a sort of traditional academic art historian. I had no idea what to do. And uh, one of my friends on a complete off chance mentioned about conservation. And again, I had no idea really what it was, but it sounded quite interesting. It was hands-on, it had a little bit of art, it had a bit of history, it also had a bit of science that I was interested in but had never pursued properly. So I like the fact that it hit quite a few different interests. Um, and that's one of the reasons I chose Lincoln was that because they had a graduate diploma that was only one year and did lots of different areas of conservation. So having just sort of discovered the world of conservation and then realized that there's actually several specialisms. And so from having just discovered it, I was like, I don't know if I want to go into crops or if I want to do this. I have no idea if I even like this. So I did that one year and realized that I did like it. Um, and again, from doing art history, I realized that I really liked paint, but we also had a building module, and I really liked buildings. And I had no idea if I wanted to go into paint or, or buildings, which I'm more interested in. And um, again, purely by luck, um, the company, which what we called Link Conservation then, but that I now work for, did um, architecture paint research, which was paint on buildings. So I was like, that's perfect. It's both of my interests combined into one. So partially luck, but partially I always just followed the things I was interested in because that's the thing I would put the most effort into. Um, and it's kind of continued since then. So I managed to get that internship and um, continue it into, a, into um, the job that came up and then the full-time role that came up. Um, and because we're quite a small number of people who work within a large institution, we've been quite lucky in that we can tailor our job and the work we take on to our interests. Um, so the work that we do comes in through commercial clients, uh, but because we're in a wider university, it gives us the, um, the flexibility to put more research into it than would be commercially viable if we were just a purely commercial company. It also means that we can draw on, um, on the knowledge and expertise of other departments as well. We, learn to, we um, lean on chemistry a lot where we see the, sort of our scientific limits of what we can analyze, and then we uh, learn from them what they can help us tell us. We uh, work with architecture when we want to scan buildings and move that into BIM, which we don't have a specialised knowledge of, but they do. So everything that we're interested in, we kind of use our expertise and the commercial projects to, to drive them. And, um, and so, yeah, so we can always sort of follow our interests in that way. And I think that's been a really um, accidental but good way of, of growing my career by putting something in that you're, that you're really interested in. You put so much more effort into and you, you find a way to figure out how to do things. Um, yeah, that's my somewhat shorter because I've had a lot less time in there and, um, and I'm, still, I'm still very, very early into my career. But um, that's, that's how my time is spent. Great, thank you. Um, Hello, um, I'm Caroline Peach. Um, I'm going to give you a brief list of introductions um, to myself and my, my own experience because my contribution to this session um, is really to feed in some perspectives from um, a piece of work on careers in heritage science um, that the National Heritage Science Forum has very recently commissioned. So 
So in terms of my own background, um, I undertook what I would describe as a highly interdisciplinary first degree um, in geography, um, and I specialised in physical geography. Um, and it's with this blend of um, the humanities and sciences that um, continue to appeal to me today. Um, I'm coming from a very artistic family that would um, what I own up to be extremely limited artistic talents personally. Um, I sought to work in an area that would um, provide me with that arts and heritage context, but um, still be an area in which one could apply sort of science and investigative uh, work. And I, I came up with uh, conservation as the solution. Um, I was fortunate to have an aunt who um, is an archaeological conservator, so I had um, some idea that that did exist as a, as a possible career um, route and opportunity. So I went and did my um, MA in paper conservation. Um, with a long-term goal of working uh, with collections at scale um, and looking at sort of the big picture challenges, I would say. Um, I completed a number of short contract roles, um, which I saw as a very positive means of learning rapidly, um, not only about different sort of subject applications and skills and knowledge, um, but also, and I think this is really important, about how different organisations and people work. Um, I then shifted to what one might describe as sort of more outreach roles, um, connecting people that don't have specialised knowledge um, with those who do and promoting um, standards in the application of, of care of collections. And I did this at the UK's professional body for conservation, which uh, initially was UKIC and then became ICON. Um, and then subsequently at the British Library in my role as a preservation advisory centre. And then in 2013, so uh, coming up to five years ago now, I set up my own limited company, um, and I can now provide consultancy services for a number of heritage organisations, and one of which is the National Heritage Science Forum. So NHSF, um, if you're not familiar with it, is a body that brings together um, academic organisations, including heritage organisations um, and professional bodies. And it does that, um, it's both a membership organisation and a registered charity, and it sets out to improve collaboration and get better use from research and demonstrate the public benefit of heritage science. Um, in January, it commissioned a piece of research, as I've mentioned, into careers in heritage science, um, looking at uh, or trying to find out about opportunities and barriers. Um, and uh, it did this in the context of, a, I think, a very uh, different operating environment for heritage science than five years ago. Um, sensitive to the impact on the sector of uh, Brexit, um, of uh, major infrastructure projects um, such as HS2 and the demand for the workforce that might arise from those, um, and also um, aligned to it um, a piece of work, uh, as Lynn said in the introduction, um, to revisit the National Heritage Science Strategy um, and to feed in a sort of skills and So the trustees wanted to gain an insight into why students choose or choose not to uh, pursue postgraduate training. So it was uh, focused on the postgraduate uh, sort of entry point and what happens to young researchers on completion. And I'm going to, the research hasn't been published yet. Um, so what I'm giving you at this stage is a sort of sense of the themes that are coming out. I've got a draft report to work from and a glimpse of the data. So I'm, I'm afraid I don't have a, a bunch of robust statistics to throw you away at the moment. Um, but the research uh, basically uh, 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 spoke to students and alumni, it spoke to training providers, it spoke to employers, and it spoke to employees. Um, we asked people about their qualifications. Um, we wanted to gain perceptions uh, of, people, of how people thought about themselves, whether they thought about themselves as heritage scientists, whether they thought of heritage science as a career. Um, and we wanted to find out um, what people's sort of career expectations were when they were embarking on uh, postgraduate study um, and what they expected from those opportunities, uh, questions about geographical flexibility and we also collected some demographic data. Um, and in terms of what we found, very, very briefly, um, uh, perceptions of the job market, case deep breath, was fairly gloomy, um, citing uh, sort of few entry level positions as Concerns, low pay, limited geographical spread of opportunities, um, and uncertainty about where to look for jobs, um, and um, the 
lack of defined career paths or opportunities for progression in barriers. Um, but that said, 85% of the respondents, a few figures, describe themselves as already in training, studying, or employed in heritage science. And of those currently employed in heritage science, 80% continued to work. I'm going to close with a handful of observations um, from the authors of the report that courses should be more realistic about employment prospects and should build in transferable skills. There should be more emphasis on encouraging people to enter areas where there is demand, such as archaeological science. Um, I think that links particularly to big infrastructure projects. NHSF should improve its links with training providers and employers and increase awareness of what heritage science is. It should go on. Um, and there's a, a sort of more general need to develop outreach and engagement programs, and that's for everyone, that's not just for NHSF, but to talk consistently about heritage science in your work. Um, and perhaps value, and, and this might, might come up in discussion, about networking opportunities to support ECRs. What's out there, what could be improved, what's missing? Thank you. Thank you, Helen.
is a Spanish born professional in Madrid. Um, I remember getting home in the evening and starting to just hate it. And, and I kept in touch with, with my graduate professors. Um, and I was always out. So when things were not, especially around 19, uh, 2007, 2008, when things started getting complicated in Spain for the construction industry, it was really time to move on. So I just knew quite a lot of people and as engineers in the country. So it was a matter of really looking out for the opportunities that arise in my interests. And don't be afraid of knocking on doors. If you know that someone is doing something that you are interested in, the worst thing that can happen is that they don't answer back. It's not really that bad, <laughs> you know. So um, I, that's one thing that I that I have always done. So it's like things that the young, the resilience that complementary each other. Um, you are building up skills that some people are going to need. Maybe maybe you catch them in the wrong time, but at least they you know they know your name. Maybe they're going to get back to you in a few months' time. So I've never really been scared of, of approaching people and turning them away to a complimentary way to engage. Great. And Philippa, I think you've also had less than equal quality. Yeah. 